It's Ramsey Dewey and Lindsay. We're here at the EFL Hi. gym live. So please let us know if you can hear us because I wasn't able to do a sound check before this. So again, if anybody's watching, I know at least one person is watching right there because I can see can you your number right there. Please let us know if we can be heard in the comments. I'm also doing this with just an iPhone instead of with a, uh, a large monitor so I can read all the comments clearly. So if I miss anything, let me know. So we're going to do a technical Q and A. Nobody's commenting yet. Can you hear me? Milo Fitness is there. Hello. Can you hear us, Milo? Can you hear us? Thomas Love is there. He says, yo, hi. Uh -huh. Can you hear us? Let us know, please, before we continue. Because if I talk for like an hour, you can hear us. Awesome. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That's good. <laughs> We're live. We got sound. So this is a technical Q&A at the gym. Mm -hmm. I got Linji here, back by popular demand. And we're going to cover whatever techniques you want to learn. So if you have questions about stand-up, traditional martial arts, jujitsu, MMA, whatever, let us know in the comments. Should I try to try and make a martial art if I get a BJJ black belt? <laughs> like make your own martial art? Um, I already did a Q&A on that question. Uh, my opinion, y you don't need to. You really don't need to. Just get out there and train and make your martial arts better. A good stance. That's a great question from Jerome. And again, these questions are just passing by so quickly. I wonder if I can get them up on the screen in a more clear way, because I don't know how to rewind this chat here. OK, good stance. That's highly variable, but let's um, make an adjustment here so we can look at the feet a little bit. We got a calf kick question after the stance question. Can you show us how to improve takedown, single leg, double legs, and all since I tend to be scared since I'm worrying about going for a guillotine, how do I bring these questions back up? They're disappearing after like three seconds and I can't read that fast. No, 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 no. I'm accidentally putting someone on timeout. What is happening? Um, how do I keep the questions up on the screen? Save highlight me. No, not that, not that. What does this do? Can you show us how to improve takedowns? All right, good stance, takedown, soinage. That's a lot already. So start with a good stance. Let's back up here a little bit so you can see the feet. Maybe bring this down just a tiny bit. Okay. Good stance depends on what kind of fight we're in. Let's bring that up a tiny bit more. Okay, what kind of fight we're in? So ordinarily, we stand like this in real life here. Lindsay, give me a push. Obviously, that's not a great stance for fighting. So I gotta have a way to balance. Generally, we put one foot behind the other. The feet can be open, can be a side stance. Right? But I need something behind me so if Lindsay pushes me, I can stay more stable and not go flying. Or if he pushes me, I can grab him and I can pull him, right? So we can overcomplicate this a lot, but we really don't need to. Generally, having one foot behind the other, having some space in between your feet, about shoulder width, it's wider than shoulder width, here's one of the problems. My steps become slower. There are certain exceptions. If you watch a fighter like Guillermo Rigondeau, great southpaw from Cuba, he will often fight in a very wide stance, step on the outside, do a crazy wide pivot, end up on the outside of his opponent. But generally speaking, small steps are quick steps. Big steps are slow steps. So keep your stance about hip or shoulder width, thereabouts, and keep your steps small. That way we can take a lot of them very quickly. Okay? Now, double legs, single legs, how to set those up. Oh, so many ways to deal with that question. This also depends on what kind of fight we're in. Is it a jujitsu match? Are we wearing a gi? Is it an MMA fight? Is it a wrestling match? Let's work under the assumption it's an MMA fight, because that's what I specialize in. So two main things we're concerned about in the MMA fight setting up our, our takedowns off of our striking or off of our clinching. And by our striking, I also mean our opponent's striking. So if I give them a nice little distraction up here, like, hey, Linji, here's a punch. Deal with that punch. Oh, just kidding. I'm going to shoot for the legs. 
Okay, that can be a decent setup in the sport of mixed martial arts. If Linji throws punches at my head and I can get under those, that can be a good setup for a takedown. Now, we can also set up our takedowns from a clinch, right? And there are so many ways to do this. So this is where there's athletic transfer between other sports, like wrestling, judo, jiu-jitsu, as long as we're not counting gi techniques, and mixed martial arts, because we're gonna end up in the clinch a lot. If I have an underhook, this is ideal, because I also have access to his legs. If I drop this arm down here, I've got access to the legs, okay? If I shoot for the legs, and I find this is a difficult takedown to finish, I can slide this up here, and I'll attack the upper body with this upper body. Okay? <clears throat> now, there's a ton of nuance in this. I've made a bunch of videos about how to set up good takedowns. If you have a particular question about it, we have one right here. My problem tends to be whenever I go for a takedown, my partners put up either wizards or underhooks to prevent the takedown. For context, I do no gi and MMA. Okay, you're getting your takedown stuff with wizards or underhooks. Okay, so I'm guessing you're probably shooting a little bit too high. And you might like a good setup, or your partners are just keep, maybe they're keeping a lead arm down. This is what I tend to do. So if I've got a lead arm down, it kind of looks like a Philly shell, and Lindsay shoots for my leg, go ahead. Look, I don't even have to sprawl on him, instant underhook. Here, let's do that on the other side. And then this lead arm is down, Lindsay shoots, and I've got that instant underhook there. Okay, so how do we deal with that? Well, again, give him a problem up high, right? Another thing I can do, if you can get control of the hands, start pulling them down, because people tend to resist you and pull the hands up, and then that can give us access to the legs. That's, that's one option for no gi jiu-jitsu, not so much in MMA. So if you grab the hands, people start throwing elbows at you if it's a cage fight, okay? But if I can grab these and pull them down, that's gonna grab me access to the legs. As opposed to lifting them up, if I start pushing them up, he'll generally start pushing them down, fighting against that, and then the hands go here, and oh, we're stuck in underhook town once again, okay? Now, Consider setting up some takedowns from inside a clinch, okay? And there are many, many ways to do this. I, <coughs> excuse me, I'm coughing a little bit today. I can set this up off an arm drag to clear that so he no longer has a takedown. Let's do that one more time. I'm in an over-under clinch. I release the underhook, get two on one on the far side, pull this down to the outside, lower my level so I got shoulder to the hip right there. If you're not attaching your shoulder to your opponent's hip, that's a problem. Now, if he is getting an underhook on you, maybe I'm shooting and he gets the underhook because I didn't get low or I didn't set it up enough. If he's got double unders, that's a problem. Get your double overs, get your feet behind you, start moving to the side in a position where you can now start pummeling or disengaging, okay? If I shoot down here and he wraps up my arms with wizards over the top, okay, Consider disengaging and making an angle and trying again, okay? Anyway, I do have videos on this topic. There are a ton of them. What do I think, what do I think about Sumo Otoshi from Judo? I can't remember off the top of my head what is Sumo, Sumi Otoshi. You're Japanese, do you know what that means? Uh, yeah, I know this name, but I don't know Sumi how Sumi Otoshi, it. do you know how to do it? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, my judo vocabulary is Arm drag to rear naked choke. Okay, that's, that's a good one. Let's do some of those. From standing and from the ground. Let's start from standing. So I'm gonna arm drag him. He's gonna move a little bit, just a little bit. I'm going to have to be responsible for moving the rest of the way. Step, okay. And now you might notice I've got seat belt control here. Grab the neck. We're gonna make a choke, there we go. If we're on the floor. So here, turn around, turn around. Let's go a little butterfly. Okay. I'm in butterfly guard, two on one, arm drag. I'm gonna push at the bottom of the knee, no higher. Not on the thigh, none of that, that won't move him. I'm gonna pull here. And now he's going to come down to all fours. I'm gonna reach up here, two on one, control. 
pull to the side, get some hooks in, reach around the neck, come behind the head, choke. Okay? But wait, there's more. I made a video about this. Go check this one out. People are always grabbing collar ties. I grab one. Maybe he grabs one too. And I'm going to get a Russian tie up here, drag him down to the floor, pin this arm to the floor, get behind the head into a rear naked choke. So it's different than an arm drag, but it's a similar concept. Again, I got a video about that. Russian tie up to rear naked choke. Go watch that one if you want to learn. Oh, I finally figured out how to scroll the comments back, and it's shockingly simple. It's just not obvious. Bug wants to fight me now. Bug, get over to the gym. Come fight us. That would be awesome. We could spar right now. If you're in Shanghai, come to the EFL gym. That would be sweet. What is the role of flying tornado kicks in a self-defense context? If you're really good at flying tornado kicks, then use what you're good at. If you're not, maybe don't. Sumi Otoshi is a throw where you just use your hands. It's like Osotogari, but no sweep. Huh. I'm not familiar with that one, so. So I can't really show you what I'm not familiar with. Can a striker transition to MMA without any offensive grappling, takedowns, scrambles, pulling guard, and only defensive maneuvers? Um, he could, but will he have longevity in the sport? No. You've got to become well-rounded. Again, so technical questions is what we're looking for today, guys. Technical questions, because we're, this is going to be more of a do than a talk type of video today. Are punchers born or made? We've answered that question many times on this channel. Can you show us some cool sweeps? Yes. You know what? Let's bring this down to the ground because we're going to move into grounded territory and show you some cool sweeps. I assume you mean jujitsu sweeps. Maybe you meant Muay Thai sweeps from standing. But we're going to show you some sweeps on the floor. Here, Lindsay, come on down here. Maybe let's back up a little bit so we're all the way in the shot. <laughs> you want tie sweeps and we're showing you jujitsu sweeps. Okay, we'll do both. We'll do both. Cool sweeps. The coolest sweep of all, in my opinion, is the basic elevator sweep because it's so incredibly useful. There are a million other sweeps, but if you can get one butterfly hook, one underhook, and control of this far side arm, you can do the most powerful sweep, in my opinion. That one, right there. So, let's back up here. You might know this one already, you might be brand new to grappling, but a butterfly hook is grabbing the thigh with your foot, by right, turning that into a hook. An underhook is your arm under their arm. I'm gonna grab this piece of it. If I don't have it, he's gonna put his hand on the floor and stop the sweep, right? I've gotta take the posts out, so I hold this on the inside. This leg, I will thread it under here. I will roll, he will fall into this negative space right there. And I'm going to climb on top into side control. That, I think, is the coolest sweep ever. But you're asking about Muay Thai sweeps. Okay? Let's stand up. The second butterfly hook does not matter in this context. This is true. This is very true. As soon as I learned that you can actually do a more powerful sweep with a single butterfly hook than with two, my mind was blown. But let's back up a little here. Do some upper body sweeps. So, my personal favorite sweep. Reach around the side here. And we're going to squeeze this hard. If you lack any strength in your shoulder, bicep, forearm, you, you might not be good at this one. But it's not one arm strength, it's about footwork. I've got to step this way. And as I step, I'm going to block this leg, and he's going to come down. So, without a partner, here's the technique. Grab, pull. So my upper body is turning, my lower body is turning, and a lot of people don't know this. I see this all the time. People think sweep means kick the leg. No, it does not. It means sweep, like a broom is sweeping. So the action 
I'm going to take the side of my foot and just brush it along the floor to stop his foot from moving. That's it. That's the principle of every sweep. I come in from the side and I stop him from taking a step. So if I push Lindsay this way, he has to take steps to stay balanced. But if I somehow, if I was able to push him this way, but stop this foot from moving, he would fall. Okay? Now, what I showed right there is not a great combative sweep, but this one is, because now I rotate. Now I, I'm going to do it without stopping the foot. So I'm going to rotate. Now his feet are free to move, so he can step to stabilize. Now as I do this, my foot just brushes in from the side. I don't kick him. I just stop his foot from moving and push it while it's in mid-air. So I pull, push, and oh, okay. on we go. Here, Lindsay, could you do that to me? So reach out the head like a side hip up, tight and tight. I grab the chin, roll to the side, and sit. And there we go. It's a simple thing. When you do it right, it looks fairly effortless. And that's, that's my personal favorite. Let's check the comments. Can you show some standing clinch control? I find in nogi, if I get an underhook, they just sprawl on it or just disengage. It's quite frustrating. Okay, uh, Emperor Jimu, with your stand-up clinch game, every time you touch your opponent, you need to be moving him, and you have to decide beforehand how you're going to move him and why. So, let's talk about collar ties to start with. Okay. I see this all the time in all combat sports that allow collar ties. People will grab a collar tie and then just wait there and camp out. And then think of it as a rest period. It's not. So when I grab a collar tie, I'm going to push him and I'm going to pull him and I'm going to make an angle. This is a frame, okay? It's a frame that allows me to make an angle and maintain this position with him on the side as long as I have this frame. It's also a pushing and pulling mechanic that allows me to move his feet. So when I grab a collar tie, I'm gonna push, and I'm gonna pull, and I'm gonna change directions there. What did I do? Karate, hiya, hiya, okay. So I grab this, I step forward, I'm pushing him, okay. That knife hand, it's a collar tie. Boom, I'm pushing him, and I'm pushing myself. Because a lot of times you can't push another person because they're big and they're strong and they're fighting back. But you can always push yourself. I'm pushing myself sideways here. Now I'm facing his profile. I'm going to that inside knife hand. Hiya! Right there. It is a reverse collar tie. I'm going to attach my forehead to it like this. And that's going to allow me to maintain this position, this angle on him, change my level, come down here to the knee, and set up my single leg takedown. Does he have an opportunity to stuff it with an underhook? No. Now, let's do that all together. Push, pull, grab. Now, we've got the leg here. But you're dealing with underhooks. You're getting an underhook. Let's assume maybe you have an over-under clinch, right? And the other guy's just wrenching up here on the underhook. You're trying to come down to the leg. He's, here, lift me up here. Lift me up. Yeah. And you're like, hey, give me the leg. Give me the leg, and he won't let you have it because you can't move through this arm. Okay, you, you've got other options. You've got a bunch of other options, man. Um, consider, instead of moving through this arm, maybe move under it. Right? Somebody was asking me about soinage. This is a great position for soinage. So I release the underhook, come under here, oh down. Yeah. Okay, that way I don't have to move through the arm. I don't even have to worry about the leg. I can attack the upper body. Does that come with a risk? Yes, it does. If I do a crappy soyanage and I don't level change and I don't connect right, I'm like, and then he starts choking me. Right? That's probably happened to you, and it probably will happen to you the first 10 times or so that you try to do that stuff. But make sure that you are moving your opponent. Oh, we got a question about triangle chokes. Awesome. Let's read this. I struggle sweeping my partners whenever. They're in mount. If they're in mount, you're not sweeping them. You're getting a reversal. This is an important distinction, All right? A sweep, you're in guard, half guard, quarter guard, and using your legs in some manner to get the top position. If you're in an inferior position, 
You are not sweeping them, you are getting a reversal. Okay? I've been taught sweeps by my seniors, but whenever we do live MMA rounds, I struggle to get them off. Also, can you show triangle choke setups from guard? Okay, yeah. So let's deal with mount. Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. Here, Lindsay, could you lie down here? Just so I can reposition the camera. Okay, awesome. There's a whole lot more that you can do besides trying to roll the other guy over from this position or sweeping as you call it. It's, it's not, that would be a reversal. Okay, so you're probably thinking, I was taught my jiu-jitsu class, grab the arm here, right? Bridge and roll in that way toward the missing arm. Go ahead and this is gonna happen. And you can do that, that's an important technique. You need to know it, okay? And you take your mouth, please. But, here, fight back, don't let me do that to you. I'm trying to get this arm, fight back, fight back. And he's like, no, oh, I can't do it. And, and uh, something happens, or, or you roll over, and he puts this arm down to balance. Uh, and and they're like, oh, I'm too weak, and he's too strong, and he's too experienced, and it's not working. Consider this. Instead of attacking the upper body, because that's what we're doing here, and we're at, a, we're at a mechanical disadvantage, think about the lower body. Okay? You got two legs. The first thing you need to make a frame with these two hands, right on the hip. Elbows in tight, like a T-Rex. Like this awesome rash guard says, T-Rex arm. It's from our sponsor, xmarshall.com. Go buy some merch. Here's my code, Ramsey10, for 10% off. I'm gonna roll over on my side. Not too far, just enough. And I'm gonna sneak my foot underneath here. And I'm gonna push this knee up. Now, I'm in half guard. I got two on one around there. And I'm gonna reach up here, and I'm going to get an underhook. Now all of his weight is off of me. Check that out. I've got a reversal all the way to the back right there. What else can we do? A lot. Well, let's break that down one more time. Take full mount. Maybe let's turn this way a little. Yeah. So I'm going to roll over. Frame on the hip. That's important. So we can't climb up in the high mount. Humble my foot under here. Push with my elbow on the knee. Lock that up. If I can get all the way over here, awesome. Awesome. I'm basically out. I'm golden. I can do what I want. I can even calf crank him here if I really felt like it. I can roll into twisters and whatever. Um, learn to escape to half guard from full mount, okay? As against a lot of people who are good, you'll never be able to do the upa on them. And you gotta spend a lot of time in this position. So let's do a few other things from mount. There are many, many escapes. A lot of times you, you start hip escaping here, Lindsay, don't let me out of mount. Okay, so I'm shrimping, I'm trying to shrimp, and he's, right now he's, he's getting the arms close to the head. This actually might be a good time to ooh -ah. You also have to pay attention to your hips. If he's sitting on your hips, when I lift my hips up, he's going to move. If he's sitting on your chest, he's in high mount. That's a different position, and you won't be able to do that. Since his hands are on the floor, great. Now we can do this. And if you didn't know, your head position is going to make all the difference on that upa, on that reverse. Move your head to the side or you won't get it. If your head is in the center, it's like trying to do a backward somersault with your head in the center. It won't happen. It can't happen. So here, let you take pull up right here. Okay. So if I have this arm, I've got it broken down. Now, when I roll you, use this arm to put it on the floor to stop me from rolling. Okay, so I do everything right except move for moving my head and he won't move, he can't move. What? I'm trying to do a backwards roll over my head, it won't work. Now watch my head. I'm gonna move it over here. Don't let me roll you, Lynch. <laughs> How does that feel? Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah I kind of get your rolling. Yeah. yeah, it's a massive difference. So think about it like this. If I'm doing a backwards roll and my head's in the center, I work. Right. If I move my head off the center, check that out. It's going to work. So move your head out of the way. A lot of people stop their own progress by just not moving out of their own way. Move your head out of your way. Can we show some Taiji twin and Bagua technique that we've never shown before? Hmm. Maybe. Do you have some secret Bagua techniques you've never shown before? Uh, yeah, I can do it, yeah. All right, let's turn the time over to Linji, our traditional Chinese martial arts specialist 
from Japan, by the way. A lot of people think he's Chinese because he teaches us Chinese martial arts, but he's from Japan. All right. Let's uh, maybe take a step back so we're in the shot a little okay. bit. Okay. All right. Every, uh, this situation is uh, his, uh, his right hand is, is before. Okay. Then uh, so many uh, uh, TMA, Ushu, likes move this hand. Yeah. But I write, uh, for instance, Papua, uh, uh, right to from here, sorry, I said, here, touch, only touch. If I push hard, it's going to move. Then turn to side. Then look, here. Uh, Pagua original name is uh, walking and uh, turning palm. So there's the turning palm. Here, don't forget to turning palm. Hmm. Turning palm. If there's no turning palm, uh, something push like this. Here, right way, turning palm. Then. Uh, so you're folding yourself around my body instead yeah, of, kind of pushing out of the yeah. way. As the, from get touch, tiny palm. At the same time. So there's, there's not a lot, a lot of pressure. I don't feel the need to resist yeah. it or push against it. Move myself, move myself. Then, then uh, in Taoru, in the form, enter. Here, the, here goes tiny palm. Yeah, so this, it's... This, this is a very basic Fagua uh, technique. Okay? Yeah. So, that, that, that's uh, interesting. Let me see if I can replicate that. So, so uh, no, no, this is, this is the... Okay, first, wrong side. Uh, for, yeah. Ah, so you got the outside. That's, the, that's what we want, on the outside. Turning the palm, then, which is really turning the whole body as one unit. Yeah. This is, how do you write this? Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and then, you want to do it? Okay, so I'm crossing. Uh, no, 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 no. This thing. Oh, the, the, this hand. Like that? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so I'm turning my, my whole body as one unit, which in ends up turning the palm. You know what this reminds me of? Here, here's the center. Here's the center. Yeah. Then, and then I can replace that. The, no, no, from? From here. Inside. From inside. Oh, so from, I'm crossing from inside. Oh, okay. So it's like, uh, okay, like, so we got even distribution of weight while changing spots on the arm. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Okay, so across, pull, um, come under, replace, yes. behind, okay. That's a cool way of making an angle. Because, you know, like Linji was saying before, if we just to muscle the arm down, yeah. he's gonna fight it, and he's going to feel exactly where I wanna be, and he's going to recenter, and if I try to like, like moving here, they're square up with me, right? He, he, he simply won't let me do it. Right? If we don't telegraph our movement, we, we talk about this all the time in boxing, taekwondo, karate, etc. Don't telegraph your movement. But I'm like, here it comes. Ah, he sees it coming from a mile away and blocks or dodges, right? Whereas if I, I don't telegraph it as much, maybe my hands are here, and I can sneak a punch in there, right? So it's kind of the same principle here, right? I don't telegraph it, I don't advertise, oh look, I'm trying to muscle your arm down, right? We can sneak in there, that's, that's cool. Then second, if if, uh, if, if crossing uh, diagonal situation, maybe uh, we can start uh, start with uh, Tai Chi. Okay. Uh, if you are Tai Chi, uh, uh, this is a uh, famous one hand push hand situation. Okay. Then down, mm. turn, 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 down, then turn, 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 turn. Yeah, he's made a window right there, so yeah. the palm can reach the chest. Push. Then break your opponent balance. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I recommend it to use. Yeah, there's some uh, Bagua techniques, and uh, but it's complicated, right? This, it's it's a. Yeah, uh, this one is very subtle and it's very simple. So essentially, right now we're even, and uh, then yeah. you rotate. Ordinary, ordinary uh, push hand is like this. Push yeah. hand, you you've seen, but here is a uh, one more movement, uh, turning palm. Turning palm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Let's get close. Yeah. Yeah. First, circling, circling. Okay. Circling. So Second, seeing. turning palm. Now he's turning the palm down and up. Turning, turning palm. Then. Okay. The second, up down. Uh, the, the the third is up down. Uh, so he's turning the palm that way. Turn. 
like this. Then okay. you, yep. you fix this position. If you fix this position, you enter your, your hand, then turn, 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 push. Yeah. It, it might not seem like a lot, but what, what we're doing here is creating a window. We're, we're passing the guard, if you will. We talk about guard passing all the time in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but not as much in boxing, not with that vocabulary. But it's just as important in a stand-up fight to pass the guard, if you will. Right here, there, there's a guard. This arm is in my way. I can't reach him. I need to get this arm out of the way somehow, but I only have two hands. So Benji is, if, if I try to punch him here, look, he can, he can stop that. If I, yeah, if I try to grab him, if I try to reach his chest, yeah, this, this, these arms, it's, it's, just, yeah. it's tough, yeah. right? But if he can push my arm down to go and do that again. Now, this arm is effectively out of play. It doesn't really feel like it is, mm -hmm. but as long as it's in this position, he's got free and ready access mm -hmm. to the chest. And push oh. or uh, hit your opponent, Joe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, let's see, how, how are we doing that? Like that? Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. Oh, yes. Now yes. I've got access to the body. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Uh, first, make a circle. Circle, okay. Second, uh, turning palm. Turning palm. Turning palm. The third is up down. A little bit. Other, up, up down. down. Okay. Up down, up down, up down. Up down. Yeah. Then after that, then push. Okay. Yeah. So circle. Up down. And then turn, turn, turn. Turn, 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 and pop. Yeah. Now we do the dim mock touch of death. I'm just. We were having a conversation <laughs> about dim mock before we uh, before we started this stream. It doesn't mean what Bloodsport told you that it means. It is not killing a sumo wrestler with a palm strike. It is not smashing a a bunch of um, bricks with your hand. What is it, Linji? What is Dimmak? Uh, Dimmak is uh, ordinary by the finger, by the finger push the, your opponent, uh, vital point. By the point, there's an easy way. Here is a really easy way. Okay. But uh, there's a the point. Uh, don't do uh, Dimmak. Uh, in Chinese, uh, directly. Mm. There are two, two ways of attack. Uh, this is direct punch. Direct mm -hmm. punch. From a uh, long range, jumping to your opponent's face. This is long range. Okay. Uh, long range, uh, uh, direct attack. But, but there's an indirect attack. What is indirect attack? This is indirect attack. Okay. One, two, three. There is, uh, maybe in Chinese, uh, it's, it's complicated. Uh, Essentially, you're showing us a strategy to get okay, okay. in the right position to actually okay. push a pressure point. If you want to use uh, uh, press your opponent's uh, better point, you must use two hands. Two hands. So you two hands pressure means, and counter pressure. Uh, mean take your opponent's hand, then second, here, you took your, your opponent's hand, then do. So he's pushing here, pulling here. Yeah, pushing here, pulling here, or here, and there, here. Yeah. If, if I do like this, it, it's, it's work. Yeah. If I do, uh, for instance, a long range, one hand, like this, yeah, I'll just be like, it, nope. it's, it's not nope. work. It's not work. Yeah, th there are a lot of important principles that transcend uh, dim mock here, right? So uh, again, if th there's a big bundle of nerves under the arm, the oxalar nerve, and if, if, I, if his arm is raised and I just poke him here and he doesn't like that, he's yeah, just gonna yeah, move yeah, away yeah, from yeah. me and he's gonna be yeah. like, nope, nope, right? And so, essentially, if I, if I pull him here, as I push here, yeah, now yeah, I can it's create... Yeah, it's work, it's work. Yeah, now it's, it's going to work better. And, uh, it's going to amplify. Maybe in the, it's, uh, it's in the grappling situation. I always say this gate, uh, especially a uh, parkour guy dislike this gate. Mm. Because if you are in this case, you can, your opponent can use dim mark. If you didn't uh, see the last Bagua video, Death gate just means standing right in front of the other guy, squared up with the other guy. It's a vulnerable position, it's an even fight. We don't want a fair fight, we want an advantage. Mm. Right? So, if here, your opponent can you d -mark. Yeah, he's poking me in right so in between the ribs. So, ordinary, in Tai Chi, uh, arm drag is not this side. It's this side. If you are in this side, your opponent can use d -mark. But if, if you are in this side, this side, yeah, he can, he can do it. So, so if there's no rule, uh, Tai Chi writes, I'm drag like this. 
So, yeah. So that, that, this, like I said, this is a principle that transcends martial arts. So like, think about Muay Thai, for example. Mm -hmm. If I do a push knee, I can push Lindy away. Ah, and yeah, yeah. It, it's not nice, but it's not super damaging. Yeah. If I grab him here, now I've got a counter pressure pulling him forward. Mm -hmm. The knee can now become the most powerful strike. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because I've got two opposing forces, like a, like a car crash head on, even fairly slow speed, like 35 miles per hour, both automobiles will be completely destroyed at that speed. Yeah. Right? This is, uh, in Tai Chi, this uh, technique named G. Uh, take one press, then push one press. Uh, uh, it's meant to press, but uh, take one point, t uh, uh, attack one more point. This is, uh, in Tai Chi, is G. Tong, Lu, G, An, then G. Yeah. Yeah, G technique. So we had a question about triangle chokes, and this principle applies yeah. equally importantly with the triangle choke. Now, come over, over here. So, right here on the neck, we've ah. got blood vessels that we try to obstruct with every choke, right? A carotid artery here and here. And if I just take my hands and start pushing into them, and I give them some pressure, then he will start moving away from me because yeah. he doesn't yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So the triangle choke creates a counter pressure behind the head where he cannot pull away, okay? So I was teaching triangle chokes last night. Let's, uh, let's do some more throat work. Mm -hmm. So maybe over here so we can get in the frame. Yeah. Here, turn, turn around, turn around. Um, facing, facing. Yeah. So here, back up a little. Here, turn, turn around. Get, get in my door. Close guard. Okay, right there. Right there. Okay, so close guard, triangle choke. We're at a weird angle. I need some sort of robot camera thing that can follow me around. Okay, that's, that's a little better, but it's still not perfect. Anyway, triangle chokes. How we are going to set up the triangle choke is going to depend on his posture. Right? He's probably going to be framing on the hips. He might have this high posture. He might be down at like a 90 degree incline with bent elbows, right? like flush against the thighs right here. Let me, let me demo this. So you pull guard. Go ahead. Okay. Through. Sorry. Let's back up just a tiny bit. Okay. Three postures. And our triangle setup is going to depend on the posture. Here, high. Second, about 90 degrees down here. Third, down here. Okay? Whether he's trying to tie up the biceps, the armpits to control the shoulders, whether he is controlling the midpoint here, where the back is about 90 degrees, or here, where we are vertical and controlling the hips. Okay? Again, if, if you want a really good guide for triangle chokes from every contingency in the guard, just about check out Mastering Triangle Chokes by Neil Melanson. It's fantastic, okay? So I'll show you some of the things you're going to learn in that book, okay? If he is up high in this high posture, controlling the hips, okay, there, there are many ways to deal with it. I'll show you one of my favorites. I'm going to make a knee shield over this arm put it on his opposite shoulder. I can kind of grab a collar tie. Now I've got pressure with the knee going this way, counter pressure coming this way, just like we were talking about with Dim Mock, right? I'm in a position where I can set up the scissor suit, right? But, see what he did with his arm right there? I don't need the scissor suit because I'm gonna slide it over the shoulder and start setting up my triangle. Now, let's do that maybe on the other side. So control the hips, go ahead. And there's this tendency to try to get these off the hips, and great if you can. If I can get a hand on the floor, cool, I can set up a triangle choke, okay? But from this high posture, take the knee over the arm, on the shoulder. When he starts fighting back, this arm pulls out. I'm gonna lift it up over the shoulder and start setting up my triangle there, okay? And now we can lock that up, etc. Um, now, Let's do a different setup. Maybe come down about 90 degrees, so pull, pull the elbows in. Okay, now this is a different situation. We've got different setups here. Okay, what's a setup that I like from here? This is not a great position trying to set up 
a knee shield because this shoulder is in the way. And if I try to do that, the setup I just showed you, it's like, oh, I'm not flexible enough, and he's going to pass your guard. So don't do that, right? Again, every technique is positionally dependent on what you and the other guy are doing, okay? The posture changes everything. Here, he might have been taught something like push one arm and pull the other and stuff the other arm. If you're going to do that, that's the position you want to do it from, but you're going to have a hard time doing that particular one against anybody good, all right? So here's one that I like to use. I can... Let's see here. I can start to pummel, and I'm going to do that with my hips because his elbows are tight to my hips. Now notice that I push my hips up, it creates a little space. He'll come right back down to where he was, but I push him up, and on the way down, I can get an underhook. Remember what I said, if you can get an arm trapped on the floor, great. You have a great setup for a triangle choke. So now I can get a shoulder pin. I can pull this down here and start pushing his head away with, with this arm, okay? Another variation of that, the shoulder pin, go ahead, is I can reach around this leg. And now this is extra tight. So I'm reaching around the leg here, okay? It's very important with this other leg, keep this one tight. Do not let it touch the floor. Don't drop it. Don't disengage. Don't be dumb like that, okay? Now I'm gonna push his head away. Grab this chunk of meat right here. Grab this arm. Work my leg under it, boom, there is our setup for a triangle choke. Now, before we do any more setups for triangle chokes, I see a lot of people get into triangle chokes or lock into triangle choke positions, but then they absolutely fail at finishing them. Okay, we'll just give you a super right here. Okay, cool. So, are we on camera? Awesome. We don't want to finish triangles from the death gate. And if you missed what that is, again, it's right in front of the other guy. Let's say I get to that perfect triangle position. I'm just going to take this mic off so we don't uh, squish the mic, okay? And I've got it locked up. And here, Lindsay, drive forward, fight back, give me some pressure. And then oh, he starts busting out of it. That's probably happened to you before, right? Because we're right in front. We're in the death gate. We don't want to fight there, okay? If you can grab your shin here, this is important because we're, we're going to change position. And we need pressure on the back. Here, Lindsay, stand up. Boom, easy. If I grab the shin, it transfers my entire body weight right here. Stand up, please. And suddenly now it's super hard for him to stand yeah. up and super easy for me to keep him there. Yeah. Get an underhook when you're fighting for a triangle. Get that underhook. Yeah. Now I can open this up. I can walk out to the side. Notice now I'm no longer in the death gate. I'm moving toward the life gate. Right? We're moving to the side. Finish a triangle just like almost every other submission from the side, not in front of the other guy, right? Imagine this hand is you, this is your opponent. Move over here. That's true with like every submission. Think about it, let's go through a few of them. If I'm going for an arm bar, I'm going to move to the side to do a successful arm bar, right? We're attacking from the side, not from the front. And what happens if I try an arm bar from the front? From the guard. I throw my leg up. Yeah, I see white belts do this all the time. They're like, hey, get over there. Pass my guard. Just put some pressure on me. Ugh. Why didn't it work? Because you were in the death gate and you died, right? So don't camp out in the death gate, man. Same thing with the Kimura. If I want a Kimura, I want to do it properly, I'm going to move over here to the side. But right? I'm not in front of him. Now, if I get this grip over here, ah, here, Lindsay, fight back, put some pressure on me. Oh, he's so strong, he just muscled out of that Kimura. No, I was a, at a bad angle, at a mechanically disadvantageous angle. So don't do that. Get to the side. What about a guillotine choke? Yeah, especially a guillotine choke. Let's say I'm trying to set up my guillotine, I break his posture down, I grab his neck, and I roll out of my back and I squeeze. That's a terrible thing to do, don't do it. So instead, I'm going to move over to the side. Check this out, I'm almost on his back. And now I can start applying pressure from here, not from directly underneath him. If you're underneath the other guy, squared up in the death gate and just squeezing his head, there's a high probability he's going to squash you. Okay? So, if you have specific questions about the triangle choke, yeah, let me know, because I've got a lot I could tell you about that. Let's see if we've missed anything. 
Oh, sweet, we got a super chat from Kami Rubinsky, who says, I would appreciate it if you could discuss the topic of defending knees in wrestling, like clinch, lower stance, and beginner hip stance than typical Muay Thai clinch. Knees in wrestling, well, it's a bit of a confusing question because in the sport of wrestling, you, we don't get kneed in the face, so I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Um, maybe you're talking about wrestling for MMA? Okay, let, let's, let's do that. So defending knees in the context of wrestling for MMA. All right, let's bring this camera up here. Lindsay, stand up, please. Here, maybe take a, a step back a little. Let's get the whole body in the shot. It's very important to observe the footwork. All right. People always say the clinch. There's no the clinch. There are lots of different ways to clinch. If I get a collar tie, this is a clinch. If I got double collar ties, this is a clinch. If I've got underhooks, this is a clinch. If I've got over-unders, this is a clinch. If I've got um, a collar tie and a wrist, this is a clinch. If I've got a wizard, this is a clinch. If I've got two on one around the back, this is a clinch. Okay, there are many, many ways to clinch. If I've got a, uh, what do we call this? Quarter Nelson, this is a clinch. If I've got a three quarter Nelson, this is a clinch. So there are many, many ways to clinch, okay? And because clinching is such a diverse set of positions, there's no, there's no simple answer to this. But to address your question, you're probably worried about this. This happened to a friend of mine, very good wrestler, his first MMA fight. He shot in from a distance, telegraphed him, and his opponent brought up this knee right out of the face. And you're bringing up that knee slowly. Boom! Oh, knockout. Fight lasted like three seconds and a very good wrestler got knocked out. It's a shame to see that. So, there are a few simple things. We were talking before. You can set up your takedowns with strikes, get its attention up high, you can set up your takedowns off of his strikes when he punches at you, and you can shoot under him, right? If he's busy punching you, he's not busy kicking you. But you're asking about setting up from inside a clinch. Now, right here in the clinch, let's, um, let's just mark through this. We're in a position where we can tag each other with knees, if, we're in a, if, we're, if we are in an over-under clinch, which is the clinch I generally use to set up shots to the legs, then our viable target with the knee is going to be legs and maybe the body, but if I bring my leg up high, it gets really easy to catch, okay? So, here, why don't you throw some knees at me? Yeah, throw some knees. Go ahead, tag them with knees. So if your opponent's throwing knees at you, inside an over-under clinch, that is a great opportunity to start catching them, right? Especially with the underhook. If I throw a knee on this side, all he has to do is bring this down, right? Now you're worried about avoiding the knees. Okay, if I keep my hips relatively close to him in this clinch, where I could use them to off-balance him, I can bump him, hip bump him here, get all his weight onto that side, it's gonna be much, much easier to move into the leg without a risk of taking a knee. If the guy's balanced on one leg, all his weight's on one side, he's not going to jump up in the air and hit you with a knee in that face unless he's a mutant, okay? So you have to be observant about where his weight is. Right now, his weight's even. If I bring my face down here, he might bring this knee up into my face. Can you do that? Boom! Not good, okay? If I shift his weight onto this leg, can you bring this knee up into my face? Uh, uh, for that moment, no. Okay. So, uh, setup I like, shift his weight onto that leg, and I'm holding on this arm. If his arm can bend, I'm not gonna, going to be able to do this. Right? So keep this arm tight. Right? So I can't just move down and grab the leg. So I've got to move back a little. I've got to straighten the arm. You see that? Straighten the arm. Now it's in a weaker position. Now, now I can reach the legs. And now the underhook doesn't do its job. So, Lindsay, can, can you give that a try? Right now, holding on tight. Move back a little on this side. So move, move your hips back. Okay, there we go. So the arm's a little straight. Okay, so it went from being here to more like here. Now, can you, can you grab that leg? You gotta move in. You gotta move in. Okay, let's, let me show that one more time. 
All right, so we're in a tight clinch. I can't move through the arm. Move back. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. What else? Again. So transfer his weight here. Pull it back. So right here, since his weight's on this leg, can you knee me? Can you kick me with this leg? Yeah, if he takes a step forward, he can. Yeah, 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 yeah. If he takes, but that's awesome. Because, take that step forward. All right, now it's a... Uh, now it's the unbalance that I need. So again, hold him back. You can even arm drag him back. Okay? But the point I'm trying to make here, if your arm is bent close to the body, like T-Rex arms, like this shirt, they're in a strong position. They're hard to move. If the arms are separated from the body, here, Lindsay, hold your arms up like a zombie. They're, they're easy to move. Now pull them in like a T-Rex. Now they're hard to move, right? So if he's got the T-Rex arm here, it's close to the body, it's hard to move. So I can move away from it, and I'm making a frame with my shoulder here. Notice my body is kind of moving into a side stance while my feet move wide. Now his arm is in a weaker position where I can move it up and down. And when I move down, he's not going to stop this. Bring your shoulder to the hip, down, in. Notice this penetration knee right there between the stance. Boom. Single, double, step out to the side, drive, etc. Anyway, I hope that was helpful and not confusing. One of the hardest parts of our coaching is just having the right vocabulary to explain what is going on. You answered all, sweet, I answered all of, all of this dude's submission questions. Awesome. You know, that's such a fundamental, simple mistake. Okay, I think I missed another super chat. Let me see if, uh, not sure where that one. Oh, we got a question about Kota Gaishi. Do you think that going from Kota Gaishi takedown to a reverse omoplata is viable? I saw it in some Aikido demo and it looked interesting. Okay, I think I know what you're talking about. So, we're, uh, I'll let you do it on this side. So, we're setting up Kota Gaishi, right? And we're starting to bring him down. His posture is broken, but then I'm gonna step over here, sorry about that, and like roll into, uh, well, we lift that one hard, but some, some goofy thing in, into an omoplata. Everything about that sequence is gonna be low percentage. Can it work? Yeah, but everything about it is gonna be low percentage. Okay. There, there are a lot of techniques you see flippy dippy stuff on Instagram or in martial arts demos and it looks cool. And it, can it work? Yeah, it can work. Omoplata is a technique that can work. Kote Gaishi is a technique that can work. We could potentially link the two together. It could work. Um, a flying omoplata, I think, is one of the lowest percentage moves out there. So uh, if, if you don't know what an omoplata is, Omoplata has a fairly high percentage in submission grappling and shockingly low percentage in MMA. So there's an Omoplata, we're just breaking the shoulder with the, uh, with our legs, with our body, okay? A flying Omoplata requires me to do several things before I can apply the submission. I'm going to break his posture down somehow, this is an oversimplification of that, and I've essentially got to step over the arm, and I'm doing this in such a weird way. I gotta get my leg over the arm, and I've got to essentially sit down without him posturing back up in the process. And it's, it's like so many things have to go right first before you can get there. It's like, look, observe these simple principles. Control, position, control, and then attack. Not attack, attack, and then position. So, yeah, one of these days we will see a flying sorcerer in the UFC, I bet. On. A sorcerer is a, it's a 10th planet technique. It's kind of like a double arm bar. And, oh man, if we ever saw flying one of those, that would be the day. Any thoughts on Tung Soo Do? It's basically just karate. And karate's awesome. So, yeah, if that's what you train, great. Go do more of it. But again, I think I missed a super chat here. I'm backing up, seeing if I can find it. 
Where did it go? Still not seeing it. Hmm. Well, looks like I got them all. Can we cover hand fighting for boxing or Muay Thai with gloves and especially like the lead hand in fighting? Yes, yes, let's go get some boxing gloves. Stay tuned, we'll be back with the boxing gloves. not adequate. So that's why I'm showing you the feet. It might not be the most aesthetically pleasing camera angle, but it's the most important if you're learning footwork. And hand fighting without footwork is not good hand fighting. So if you can't hand fight with boxing gloves on, you can't hand fight. So Generally speaking, we want to punch the other guy in the face or in the body. I want to get to this angle where I can attack this way. I want to get to this angle where I can attack this way. All right? But these pesky hands keep getting in the way. Like I said before, in jiu-jitsu we always talk about passing the guard. This is the guard in boxing. The shoulders, the hands, the elbows, the forearms, all of this stuff to prevent me from getting punched at all. Right? And until I can get past this guard, find some way to move this guard out of the way, it's not going to happen. So, the basic speed bag pattern, Jack Dempsey called it a tattoo on the speed bag, I don't know why he used that word, but um, essentially hitting this hand down to make a very brief window, but there's a problem because this second hand comes up. If I hit him hard, maybe I'll do some damage here, but if I repeat that pattern, block this one, boom, now I make an opening here. Let's switch sides right there. So again, this is a speed bag pattern that we can use in real life. I use this one a lot. Hit that one, punch, he's going to block it, maybe not. Hit that one, punch. This is why we need to see the footwork. So without a partner, block, punch, block, punch. All right, so we're moving at angles. We're changing angles. 90 degrees to the right. 90 degrees to the left. Okay. So that's, that's one of the most basic hand fighting patterns for boxing that I can show you. And you can rep that out thousands of times in a single speed bag session. Now, if you just stand in front of a speed bag and just moving your arms, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. Get the footwork in there. And you can do the same thing on the heavy bag. What does that look like? Looks a little bit like the Dempsey roll. Remember when Jack Dempsey fought Jess Willard? Now, not talking about the level change, but the footwork when he knocked Jess Willard down for the first time back in 1919 in the World Heavyweight Boxing Championships. Jess was a tall guy, Dempsey was shorter, right? There was a lot of hand fighting preceding this, a lot of movement in and around the clinch and so on. And whew, Dempsey tried to go high, but since his opponent was so much higher and the elbow was a little up, boom, he landed a body shot. He came up here, boom, came up to the head and repeated the process until his opponent went down. Okay, so without the footwork, this doesn't work. If I try this dead set in front of him in the death gate, he will immediately punch me right in the face with his straight right as soon as I block the straight left. Boom, even if this hand is up, that's no good. I gotta move off the center line here into the life gate. Boom. All right, he's gonna start squaring up immediately. I trap this one to the body. And as he squares up, he's turning that way already, I hit him on the side. I love this one, okay? Let's do a few more. Do you remember linking or the reverse punch from the speed bag? We move back and forth like this, okay? So I'm gonna deal with this front hand. So I push it a little bit, I move like love, and I slide it, I sweep it through, and now I pull it back. What does that do? Give him a little push, generally gets him to give me a little push back. 
people tend to match your force with equal force in the opposite direction. We push, they push back. We pull, they pull back. So I push, she starts pushing back. Now it gets easy to pull down. Okay? So again, in and out. Notice my footwork. I change my angle. I move off the center line. Okay? So, and now this hand came up to block it. Cool, because I've got a second one coming in at this angle. Here, let's switch sides so we can show that on the other side. Again, linking, the first one, boom, boom. So that whole combination, linking, move that hand out of the way, boom, boom. Okay, we got a 90 degree pivot right there. One more time, boom, okay. Other hand fighting for boxing that I really like with the gloves. You remember this Tai Chi technique? Yeah, you can do, you can do some Tai Chi technique in boxing too, right? Hand fight. I make frames here, right, so he can't move through them. And I bring my shoulder to his shoulder. We could start a grappling exchange here, but I'm going to move that arm out of the way and keep boxing with him. So let's do that in a little fashion. Right here, okay, boxing. When this guard is in the right kind of position, I move into it. Right? Now, I'm not going to hug him. This is very important. Don't hug him. Keep that shoulder in between you. Bring this over here. Hold. Body shot. So all the way up to speed. And after you land that one shot, one magical shot's not getting the boxing match, throw another one. And another one. Make sure your combos are twos and threes, not ones. Right? A lot of people out there boxing, they hit the other guy. Oh, what's this? Oh, look at me. Out the other back. Good job. I landed a jab. And while you're congratulating yourself, the other guy throws three punches right in your face. Don't do that. So, send your punches and combos of twos and threes. Change your level, change your angle. So, I'm up here. I get my club hands. I land that body shot. Cool. Throw another one up high. Throw another one up high. Give him a couple of problems at a time. Give him three problems at a time. So, let's review that one one more time. I make a frame. Move the shoulder in. Arm dragon. Shovel hook, overhand right on the other side. So, cloud hands, frame, shovel hook, overhand. Throw another one. Anyway, fun stuff with the boxing gloves. You, you, if you don't know anything about hand fighting in boxing gloves, it's a good time to learn how to start, right? Because how many sparring sessions have you had, boxing, kickboxing, whatever, where you're wearing the boxing gloves and everything's just landed flush on your partner's guard and none of the punches are getting through? If so, then hmm, fix the hand fighting. Okay. Can we talk about wrestling as it pertains to boxing? Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, you can take those off, that's okay. So, wrestling as it pertains to boxing, a lot of people, it's a match that's fresh in people's memory, Tyson Fury, Francis Ngannou, and Tyson Fury's a big dude, and he's, he's kind of used to getting his way with people, getting in here, leaning on them, grabbing them, making them bear his weight until the ref can break them up, and Ngannou did something really simple. He didn't let Tyson make him bear his weight, in fact, he made it the other way around. So... A few simple principles. When you, I, I, sh I should say, don't clinch in boxing, get close, but don't clinch. This is the brilliance of the Philly shell. Okay? And let's switch sides for a moment. Right here, if I got a high guard, Linji grab some double underhooks, grab and squeeze. Okay, uh, hold on, hold on, right? So he's holding on in a boxing match, the referee's gonna come over, break us up. Maybe give us a warning, hey, quit stalling, okay? Now, I move into a Philly shell, grab me, squeeze, get a clinch. Nope, nope, nope. I'm making myself an object too wide to grab here. So this lead arm, if he does start getting a hold of me, turns into an underhook, and I can make a frame with the shoulder, 
I can just make myself lighter with my legs, loop myself out or shoulder bone him, and make an opening for my right hand there. Okay? So this is one of the most important wrestling for, MM, for boxing tactics that there is. Okay? When you get close enough to clinch, feel the shell. Okay? This makes me too wide to grab and puts me in a position where he's not going to be able to get hooks on me and I can disengage and get the sneaker punch in at my will and leisure. What's a sneaker punch? For those of you who don't religiously study Jack Dempsey's book like me, a sneaker punch is when you break a clinch of your own free will and volition, not the referee. It's not hitting on the break because there's no break. I make a little space and I throw that punch in. This is one of my favorite techniques. We'll be out there boxing. Outside the pocket, I'll establish my jab, make him respect the jab. And there's a hole right here in the guard, and I'm going to fill that with my shoulder. And now I'm either going to push him or push myself away just enough to make space for that sneaker bunch, and of course follow it through with with a couple more. Okay, so up to speed, on the jab, fill the hole right there. Okay. So, arm drags, this is another thing. A lot of people don't know you can arm drag and boss. Okay? If I'm here, and I can reach around there, great, I can arm drag. I'm not going to hold on. This arm drag can set this up. But a lot of times people have really tight elbows on and can't get the inside, especially with a big glove. So pull your arm tight to the body. Like this. Yeah. I can reach around the outside and do the same thing. This isn't a level change arm drag like in wrestling where I'm trying to bring him down here to get to the leg. This is a boxing arm drag where I'm moving myself more than him. His, his elbow is just going to move out of the way of the floating ribs so I can get that nice shovel hook and set up my right hand. Okay? Anyway, two simple concepts for wrestling, for boxing. I was confused last class on single leg takedowns especially. The actual takedown part, says Maddie Wadsworth. Okay, now there are a lot of finishes for single legs. Okay, I could show you a couple dozen finishes, but I'm guessing they probably taught you running the pipe, which is a popular finish. It's a good one, you should know it, but it, it can be very confusing. So let's see if we can demystify running the pipe. All right, get your head on the inside. There are many finishes that we can finish with a head on the outside, but for this one, get your head on the inside, because I'm going to use my head to push him with. We're going to get a gable grip. That's a monkey grip with no thumbs, or a butterfly grip. Very similar grips here. Butterfly grip, gable grip, right? Crappy grip. Don't use the crappy one. Right under the knee, so I get in here, boom. So you're getting here, right? And you're like, how do I finish this? And your coach is probably telling you, Pivot to the outside, put some pressure on it, and then he's gonna go down, right? What makes him go down? Here are the mechanics of every single, single leg finish. Right? Every single leg finish looks different, but they all operate on the same basic principle. I'm gonna elevate this leg, and I'm gonna push his hip down. So if I pull up on his ankle, and I push down on his hip, he'll go down, right? Now, that's not a takedown I would use in a fight, because he'd hand fight me to death right there. But I'm going to do the same thing with my body here. So it's also very important to unbalance him first. If he is steady on that one leg, he can hop around quite a bit. So let's move in here just a bit. When I shoot for that penetration step, look what it does. It makes him hop around, makes him unbalanced. An unbalanced guy is much easier to take down than a guy who's steady even on one leg. When I have this leg, my outside foot will step in a circular motion, 90 degrees to the outside. My head will push into his body, right? This area between the head and the shoulder, that's gonna push him, that's gonna drive him, but your legs are gonna do the work. Do you know why it's called running the pipe? Anyone else grow up in a small farming community where you have to change sprinkler pipe? You pick up sprinkler pipe, chuck it between your legs to move it. Right? Pick it up, chuck it between your legs, right? So we're essentially stepping, squatting, pivoting. So without an opponent, add the legs, step, squat, pivot. That action, the shoulder, the body, the pivot, drives the hip down, 
and running the pipe through your leg, running the leg through your legs, lifts the ankle up. Let's compare that with another single leg finish. My personal favorite, learned this one from a Tai Chi master, the golf swing finish. Right, this is used in a lot of martial arts from Tai Chi to, to good old American wrestling, right? But it has the same principle. Now, it's a different kind of pivot. So I make him pivot instead of me. I can do this if his leg is completely straight. This foot will come up, but his hip will go down. So I lift it up to the outside to bring it straight and unbalance him. And now I pull the leg straight and down. But as he's coming down, I start pulling the leg and then his hip. As I elevate the ankle, the hip comes up. Okay? Maybe I can show you a few other finishes for a single leg. So, again here, I'm going to pick up this leg. Hey, remember we were talking about sweeps? Elevate with your hips. We can either mat return them or sweep the standing leg. That's a nice one. Here's another one, a knee tap. So, I get a hold of this one. Now, notice if I push, he hops on it. Okay? But what if I push, he hop, and I tap the knee? It's the same exact principle as a sweep. It doesn't, it's not a big slap, it's not a hit. It's just, I tap that as he's trying to take a step to balance, so he cannot take the step to balance. Okay, here's another one I like. I have the single leg, I'm gonna move my head to the outside. And we're gonna roll. So it's a lateral roll finish. And like a fancy finesse move. I got videos on this one too. Anyway, there are tons of finishes for single legs. What was the most ridiculous technique that you've seen done that worked on a trained person and can demonstrate it? The buggy choke. <sighs> Go to my Instagram page. The last video that I uploaded was me grappling with Jordan Chow and on his 300th try to finish me with a buggy choke, he made it work. Ah, this is a good question. Um, Domenico says, I saw an old video of you explaining a foot stomp and a Taiji technique to generate power. I practice it, but I'm never able to get it to work. It may be because I'm very light, but could you elaborate? Okay, sure, sure. So if I'm doing an arm drag, let's move over to this side so you can see the arm. Okay, if I just pull with my arms, it's going to be a really weak arm drag. If I attach my body to it, now I can move him with my body weight. Okay? If I add a little... Essentially, I'm jumping both feet up in the air, but a small jump. And now I put the, 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 the weight of the fall into this arm. I'm connecting it shoulder to shoulder, very tight. Okay? And this can generate enough power to make him move. Now, you're not going to throw him across the room. It's, it's not like I'm going to zap him with some magic power, right? But when you have a big guy who's hard to arm drag, this is going to make his shoulder move from here to here. Now, if that's still not enough, consider what Marcelo Garcia did. And this is awesome. I use this one all the time. It's one of my favorite ways to catch a single leg or an ankle pick, right? Instead of stomping and catching myself on my feet, I'll go all the way down. And it doesn't matter if he came down with me or not, because now I'm up on a single leg, on his leg here, okay? So let's do that one up to speed. So, look, he didn't come down with me yet, but I've got access to his feet. So what's happening there? I start the arm drag, and instead of that stomp, that fall, I come all the way down, boom, to the ground with the arm, put myself in access to the leg. Let's do that nice and slow. So even if I'm super weak and super light, and I have no power, no weight to bring him down with me, who cares? I came down here. I've got access to the feet. You can't stand without feet. I wish Terry Silver would have said that. If a man has no feet, he can't stand. Anyway, Lindsay, I appreciate you being here, man. <laughs> Hmm. 
All right, do we have any other questions? Is there a way to practice MMA and wrestling grappling with no partners? Yes, it's called shadow wrestling. Okay, a lot of martial arts in that forms, Taolu, Kata, Pumse, whatever you want to call it, and do things like this. Right. And it's shadow wrestling. It's all shadow wrestling. Let's say Lindsay and I are over here fighting, and I grab his wrist, and he do do a low block. Karate block right there, boom. Okay, and I grab his hand here, do another low block, ah. And I grab the hand here, ah. He gets strip grips all day, that's, that's shadow wrestling, right? So when you learn a wrestling technique, practice it. And it doesn't have to be all stand up, while well, most wrestling happens on the ground. So let's say I'm gonna shoot for the legs, boom. And maybe he wants to sprawl to stop that takedown. So Lindy's gonna sprawl. Okay, and then he's going to move from here to a more advantageous position so that he can use this, maybe grab this and roll me over or something, okay? Now let's shadow wrestle that without a partner, right? I imagine he's shooting from my hips. I sprawl him, I circle, I grab the back. I can roll him over, gut wrench him, something like that, right? Now, you need the context of experience for shadow wrestling and shadow boxing, shadow fighting in general to be effective for you. Oh, another question from Maddie who says, if I'm allowed more than one, could you cover escaping from full mount? Yeah, sure, more full mount escapes, absolutely. Here, Lindy, uh, sit on the floor for a minute so I can position the camera. Perfect. All right, let's go back to full mount. So, we discussed before trapping the leg into half guard, which I think is one of the most high percentage things you can do. And make sure you know how to play half guard, right? There's so many things we can do there. Move up into a butterfly hook, and then, you know, hit the best sweep ever invented by human beings. So, let's do something new though. Some, something that'll give you a lot of trouble, especially when you start out, you'll start hip escaping. And what's the purpose of hip escaping? Hip escaping is to move you from high mount to low mount. Here, Lindsay, climb up into high mount and set up on the chest here. Right, and posture all the way up. High mount is a beat down position. Can you hear how my voice changed? Here, posture up, posture up. Yeah, can you reach my, my chin with your fist? Yeah, but I can't reach his chin with my fist. We're at a huge disparity of advantages here, okay? High mount sucks if you're on the bottom and it's great if you're on top. I want to move to low mount. That's what, Hip escaping, shrimping is four. So I'll frame on the hips, I'll push with my legs, and it doesn't get me out of mount, it puts me in a low mount. All right, this is the most important thing to understand. A lot of jiu-jitsu instructors never tell you this, they'll just tell you, you'll magically pop right out. You'll never magically pop right out shrimping against anybody good, but you will move to low mount. Now he's on my hips. Now when my hips move, he moves. If I bridge, he comes up, okay? If he's in high mount, you'll never ever do that. All right, so here, posture up again. Now, he wants to climb back up into high mount. I've got this frame, I'm making a fist, and I've got a hook, a monkey grip, right over my wrist joint, right on his hip joint, elbows in tight like a T-Rex. Now, climb up into high mount again. As long as I maintain this frame, he's just pushing me. I maintain the exact same position, we're moving across the mat here, but I'm in the same exact position. Okay, so you gotta maintain the strength. Don't let your elbows flare out or he'll slide right up into high mount again. Yeah, just like, oh, oh no, I'm too weak. No, you're not. Your elbows just aren't in the right place. So put your elbows right there, right against the knee. Forearm flush with the leg. This arm straight across the hips. Won't you get punched in the face? Yes, but you'll get punched in the face a lot more if you do nothing. So from here, now we can fight back. So a lot of people will move to it is sometimes called technical mount, and they'll bring this leg up here. Lindsay, bring up your leg and put, put your foot on the floor. Like, like foot on the floor. Yeah, like that, and they'll keep this tight. And so you're trying to hit the skate, and it's like, oh, I, won't, I don't fit out that way. Okay, now you can switch directions. Now your butt fits out that way, okay? Technical mount, I think, is one of the easiest things to deal with, but a lot of people get very frustrated with it. It's really not that technical. So let's move back here, so we're back in frame. 
Let's deal with this technical mount first. So I start hip escaping, move to technical mount. Bring your foot up. Yeah. So he's going to pinch this, this foot in tight to my body so there's no space for me to shrimp out on that side. Once again, I could go to the other side, but I've got this hole here. And there's a temptation to reach one arm under. Don't. You'll get triangle choked by anybody good. But what you can do is bring both arms up. And then bridge. Okay? So, here, let me, let me give that a try. If I, and let's move this way so they can see that hole in the leg. Right? So, escape high mount. Okay? Go ahead and start shrimping. Okay, so he's shrimping. And I'll bring this leg up and make it tight. So there's no space down by the floor, but there's a little bit of space here. Bring both hands like this, under, and now bridge. Now I move a little bit, he moves a lot. So I move from here to here. So let's do that one more time. I'm gonna take him out. I'm gonna start shrimping. He's gonna move to that technical mount. And when he's making that transition, palms up, bridge. Over we go. Probably a little faster than that, but that's the idea. Now, there's more. There's a lot more. You should be very proficient with mount escapes. Have many, many in your arsenal. If you don't already, spend time every week doing mount escapes. Do like 10 minutes of mount escapes live every week. Just have someone sit on you. Their goal is just stay on top. Your goal is get out. He's sitting in low mount. Low mount is not a great control position. Low mount is where you do the upa, right? So anybody going will be fighting for high mount, S mount, you know, up here, controlling the shoulders, or for a technical low mount, which I'll show you in a minute here. Okay, so move up to a high mount. I'm gonna make that frame to stop him. Now I've forced him into an untechnical low mount. He's attached to my hips, okay? If he's bent over like this, this is ideal. Now, I'm gonna make frames on his hips, right under the rib cage, with my hands, elbows in tight, bring my feet close to my butt so I can explode upward, and push up. <laughs> now, it might probably looks like I'm bench pressing him. I'm not. I've turned my arms into frames by locking them out. Now, I can put both or one leg under. You're welcome. Or, if you can make a lot of space, if you catch him by surprise, he's leaning over here. I get my hips directly under his. Up and pulled into a butterfly guard position. If he stands, cool, you can start working X guard or whatever other standing fighter versus down fighter guard that you know. Okay, let's do another one. Now from here, um, sprawl into a low mount. So get, get some upper body controls, sprawl. Get, get your hooks in the, in the legs. Yeah. So from a good fighter, when he can't get high mount, will get a technical low mount. He'll control your legs with grapevines. He'll sprawl on you. Okay, and now you're not going to be able to use your hips from here. So I've got to free my legs. So I'm going to straighten them out. <laughs> straighten your legs. Yeah, imagine you're like trying to pull your pants off here. Get the grapevines again. Your grapevine legs, yeah. And I'll push up here a little, and I'll kick my legs straight up as much as I can. Now I'm up. Now I can start rotating onto the side. If he remains in this position, that low mount position, trapping the leg in half guard is paramount. I made a whole video about escaping from this position using the stomp and the super stomp. Eddie Bravo teaches that stuff. It's good. It's good technique. And it's a guy who's big and heavy. And yeah, from there, I trap his leg to the floor so I can get my butterfly hook with the other leg. And remember what we said at the beginning of this whole thing. Single butterfly hooks are actually more powerful then double butterfly hooks when you know how to use them. Why? Because we create a space for them to fall into. I've got videos on mount escapes, a ton of them. I got a whole technique playlist. It's called Fighting Techniques. It's on my homepage here on YouTube. Go watch it. All right, what else do we have? What is the highest percentage rate of front body lock takedowns? If you have double underhooks and you get your shoulder to the body, pretty high. If you don't have that position, pretty well. So if you don't know what we're talking about, I've got my arms, gable grip right on the lower back there. I've got my shoulders and my head and the chest, and I push here, and down he goes. Right? And when you do that, please. 
He's got the body lock. Forces me to break the posture there. If you get that position super high, how often does that happen in a fight? It can happen pretty often if you push him up, up against the cage. That's where most takedowns happen in MMA, up against the cage, not on the open mat. So if you're not practicing the wall work, fix that. Can I show you a smother choke? I mean, just like cover the dude with the hands and don't let him breathe. That would be asphyxiation, not actually a choke. But I could show it to you. All right, here, Lindsay, can I borrow you? Sit down from back mount here. Let's bring this camera down a bit. Okay, have a seat. Okay, smother chokes here are pretty simple, but I, and it's hard to finish people who are good with them unless you can, you know, trap the hands with the legs. But generally, you're trying to get the choke, and he's hand fighting here, fight back. He's grabbing my hands, he's like, no, you don't. And I keep trying to get to the neck, and he's tucking his chin, and, and it's, it's just hard to do this. So I can take a hand and instead cover the nose and mouth. Now, he might start reaching for your hand, okay, and trying to pull it off. Okay, and that's, that's fine. Now, I would say something more useful than trying to cover the nose and mouth is grab the chin and pull it up. And now we can get this under, right? So, th there was a match I saw recently where it looked like the guy was trying to smother with the hand, but he was trying to pull the chin up. And the other guy grabbed the hand, pulled it up, and then bit the hand and got DQ'd. And he was like, what, you can't bite in jujitsu? No, you can't bite in jujitsu. But pull the hand up, Hold the chin up with the hand, and now you're going to have clear access to, to the head right there. Okay, so here, sit up a little more. But if you can trap an arm under the leg, this gets a lot easier. He still has a free hand. Here, fight back. So now he's going to stop this hand. Okay, I can pull the chin up here. Now his focus is on this hand, not the choking hand. Boom. So I, I find that's, that's a lot more useful than just trying to bully somebody who doesn't know how to hand fight with a, a smother choke, if you will, which isn't a choke at all. Again, it's asphyxiation. Then again, most of what we call chokes in jiu-jitsu aren't actually chokes. They are strangulation. What do I think of the scorpion kick? <laughs> That's a movie move, man. It's a movie move. Have I ever done it? Nope. Am I ever going to? Nope. It's like a video, video game move. All right, how are we doing on time? I think we're, we're just about out of time. So maybe we'll take one more question and then call this a night. Ooh. How do we deal with an opponent's collar ties effectively? Our friend Haboogi is having trouble dealing with collar ties. This is one of my specialties. Okay. So let's bring this up here. Don't even need to focus on the feet here. Well, we kind of do, but let's focus on, on the head. And I'm, I'm going to take this up so that we don't uh, create a bunch of static. So collar ties. You grab one and a very common thing, your opponent's going to grab one too. And then you're, you're like, what do I do? And Okay, look. There are a bunch of ways to deal with this. Russian tie up, strip it off that way. Don't know how to do that. I've got three videos on this on the topic. Elevate, turn, grab, hold the shoulder, get close, put your head right there. Tie a knot, take his back, shoot for the single. Learn a Russian tie up, learn some variations of it. That's a great way to clear the tie. Now, sometimes you'll get a guy digging his fingernails in the back of your head, and so trying to peel, peel the head off with a t Russian tie-up is, man, might not be in your best interest, especially in the practice room. So what else can you do? Reverse collar tie. Okay. Grab a collar tie with the other hand, please. Right. So this hand's here. I'm going to bring this under the chin. I'm going to break his posture by elevating my elbow. I can bring this hand up. Look, and now he's going to keep pummeling. So I'm gonna keep pummeling. I can reach for an underhook here, or come down to the leg, or get a body lock from there. Okay. Let, let's just go live for a minute. We're, we're, 
I'm going to show you one of the most important rules for pummeling, for dealing with collar ties, for Muay Thai, for wrestling, for MMA in general. Okay? We're going to pummel for collar tie, for, you can get whatever grip you want, but the goal is tag the leg or the body with the knee, or you can punch the body light, very light. Okay? And we're just going to clinch and pummel. Only strike while we're clinching, so not kickboxing, not up here. If we're clinching, we can tag each other. That's it. Okay, we're going to do this for eh, a while. Now let's see how it goes. I'm going to take the mic off. Are we in the shot? Not quite. I want to see the feet. All right, cool. Let's go. I think that's probably enough. So, how long did we do that for? Like a couple minutes. Um, that, it's a really simple drill, simple rules. If you tuned in late, what are we doing? We're just clinching. You can punch the body, knee the legs or the body, light contact, just think touch. And a bunch of things happen. Hand fighting, footwork, pummeling, clinching. I, I can tell you, if somebody grabs a collar tie, Got a reverse collar tie, do this, do that, whatever. You need to practice that. But if you don't have live practice where three dozen other variables are thrown at you at that moment, it's not gonna be as helpful. So do that clinch fighting drill. I'm, I'm gonna tell you, one of the most important Muay Thai instructors I had made me do that drill for 10 minutes every day. And the first time I did it, I got a little out of breath. I was like, oh man, that's exhausting especially with a good Muay Thai fighter. And, and he laughed and he said, children do this drill in Thailand for 30 minutes as a warm up. Ha 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 ha. Silly foreigners. Anyway, it's a great drill. You don't have to do it 30 minutes every day, but if you do, great. But whatever your weak point is in martial arts, make sure to incorporate a drill where you address that issue live 
to some degree with limitations. Now that's not free sparring, it's not MMA, because in MMA there's too many variables to the point where we won't do that technique. Has this ever happened to you? Here, let's, let's come on down, the, down to the ground for a minute to illustrate this. So, um, let's pretend this is a jiu-jitsu class. And in this jiu-jitsu class, we're learning the kimura. And we learn, grab the wrist, get the double wrist lock, make the angle, push the arm up. Oh, great. We rep it out like 20 times. Now we know the kimura and the coach is like, all right, time to roll, guys. And then we start rolling and I pull guard. I'm like, now then she fight back, fight back. And they're like, give me the... And he, oh, oh no, he's pinning me. I, I can't get the arm, he's too strong, what's happening? And this happens to you. And you're like, oh, that drill, like I know it up here, but I don't know it in here because now he's fighting back. Now he's throwing variables at me that I haven't experienced yet. He's trapping my arms in ways that I haven't considered before. Now, if we can break this down into a drill, like maybe I get the Kimura grip, okay, but I'm not applying pressure. And we're gonna do 10 second goes where he fights back and I try to finish the Kimura. Here, Linji, fight back. And he's like giving me some pressure and I'm getting used to the type of pressure. I'm gonna see if I can finish it. Ah, oh, maybe he explodes out because I did something wrong. Okay, let's go back and try it again. Okay, and go, fight back. Oh, he's fighting back and maybe I need to finish. I fix my angle this time. And now, oh, he's, he's too strong. Is it about strength versus strength? Maybe it's about position. Maybe if I move over here, I can make that work a little more. Oh, he's holding on to my, my leg. Maybe if I hold the lever by the long part, instead of the short part here, it's gonna be more easy to move, right? So it's gonna allow us to troubleshoot if we break sparring down into smaller digestible chunks. And now, after a while, maybe we get good at finishing the Kimura once we get the arms locked up. So we take a step back. And now instead of starting with the double wrist lock, the Kimura almost finished, maybe I start from here. I've cleared the shoulder, I've got wrist control, and now we do 10 second goes, go, fight back. And, oh, oh no, I missed my opening and he, yeah, he's hand fighting now. Okay, I learned a lesson, we start over. Here, fight back. And okay, now I, I'm able to catch this, but my thumb's in the way because I'm holding with a C grip like an idiot. Oh, but I've seen people do that. Yeah, they're stronger than you. That's why they get away with it. Okay, here, let's do that again. Here, fight back. And now I've got it with the monkey grip. Now I change my ankle. And now he's grabbing my leg again, so I remember the lesson from the first time. Lengthen the lever, hold onto the wrist. Now it's easier to move his hand, right? Wrist control is more powerful than forearm control, right? Hold the lever by the leverage point, not by the weak point. Anyway, so we learn a whole bunch of lessons when we break down our sparring into digestible little chunks. Like guys like Kit, Kit Dale call it games, like jujitsu based games. And if, if you can turn it into something that's fun, great. And cue me in on how to make it fun, right? Because um, not everybody has fun with the same thing. I have fun rolling, I have fun sparring. For some people it's a grind, doing those things over and over again. Anyway, great questions. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Lindsay, thanks for joining us today. And as always, get out there and train.